Welcome to SHOT Show TV. I'm Rachel Kopchak coming to you live from the SHOT Show TV studio. We're right here in the middle of the Sands Expo and I'm joined now by Frank Miniter. He is a columnist for Forbes and he also has many other titles and accomplishments in covering this field here. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what has been the biggest buzz for you, you know, since you got to SHOT Show? You know what I find interesting, because I write politics, and I'll be in the mainstream, I write for Forbes, and I do a lot of gun politics stuff there. Mm -hmm. But I also do a lot of the product stuff. I write for a lot for the NRA and for other magazines. And you see the two mixed. You look at what's going on in this country and how volatile the gun industry has become. Mm -hmm. And then you come here, and you don't hear people talking about the politics of it. When you bring it up to them, they look at you like, well, I can talk about that if you want, and I vote that issue, and it's important and all that. But wouldn't you rather like talk about this new gun? I mean, look at the new Kimber Revolver we have over here. Let's go check it out. We don't want to talk about that. Right. So I think that would surprise President Obama, uh, for one thing. Mm -hmm. He walked into this crowd, 100 million gun owners in this country. Here we have 60,000 people, the gun lobby, the gun industry. They're all in one place right now, buying, selling guns. Uh, but how little they're actually talking about him. It's not about him. It's not about gun politics. This is about a big part of America. Mm -hmm. That's what surprises me every time I come to the SHOT Show. Yeah, it surprises mm -hmm. me as well, too. Now let's talk a little politics. Why don't you uh, go into some of what you've written about when it comes to the president's most recent executive order? Yeah, the executive actions are troubling, not on their face, though some of them are so vague that it drives people crazy. Because right. what is a gun dealer? He wants to uh, have the government, the ATF, or the Department of Justice decide who gets to be who's a gun dealer, who's not a gun dealer. Is some uh, grandfather who sold a couple of firearms in the past year, can he be considered a gun, gun dealer? Can then the ATF come after him and put him in jail and, and, and a felony conviction on this guy because he, he sold a gun or one or two guns? Where is that defined? It's not defined as executive action. That's a big trouble spot. Now, if this had gone to Congress the way he should be working, um, they could have worked this out, both sides come together. But Obama, unfortunately, doesn't want to work with both sides. He's, he'd rather say the NRA is, is bad and all this kind of stuff and put them down, politically uh, fight the battle, instead of actually bringing the sides together to really come up with solutions for the places where we still have gun violence in this country. Right. So what does this all really mean? How is this directly going to affect and play out, let's say, over the course of this next year for, you know, range owners and manufacturers and dealers and just the whole gamut? Yeah, I really wish I could answer that question, but right now on WhiteHouse.gov, he has a fact sheet explaining these executive actions. Yep. But they really don't exist yet. They have, they're not something I can hold up as a journalist, read, interpret, understand, get a lawyer involved in it, and really understand what that is. They're so vague. Right. that it's, it's all over the place. So I really can't answer that question. There's a lot of uncertainty then put into the market, into the industry, into our rights, because President Obama has decided not to work with gun owners, but instead to have these decrees. Yeah. Well, let's switch a little bit and talk. We're going to continue to talk about the future, but you've written a book about the future of guns. What was the title again? It's called The Future of the Gun. That's what I thought. And yeah. um, so what's the future of the gun? Well, technologically, it's fascinating because there is a lot of change going on. And I think if people came in here who were not pro-gun, um, and they saw some of the technology, some of the cool stuff that doesn't do anyone any harm, but it's fun. How much that's being pushed, I think they would be really surprised. You know, they want to talk about smart guns, which is a scientific, I mean, a, a sci-fi kind of idea um, of the gun can then somehow recognize a user and not work for someone who doesn't work. It's, it's a technology fine. I, I'm, I'm not opposed to it. Uh, the NRA is not opposed to it. The National Shooting Sports Foundation is not opposed to it. They're just opposed to it being made mandatory. And there's a good reason for that. You well, can't yeah. retrofit it to every fire. I mean, walk around the SHOT Show here, see all different guns, makes and models. How could you possibly fit this electronic gadget to every type? You'd have to ban them all, start over with some gun that's not working to get the whole process started, which is what they, of course, want to do. So that, that's a piece of the future of the gun that it's unfortunate that it's gotten so political because there are solutions out there. Maybe someone does want to buy a gun that would only perhaps work for a, you know, in that situation. Fine. But there's so much being moved. And when you talk to, when you see the guns here and you talk to the military, and I go both, I go both ways and talk, what's, what's coming on, what's going on with the M4 and all this kind of stuff, you find out that actually there's a connection between civilian ownership of guns and the military's ownership of guns. It goes back all the way to George Washington, the flintlock, the American long rifle, up through the 19th century, revolvers, lever action, then bolt action, the semi-automatics when they came along in the late 19th century. Always civilians and the military have owned the same platforms. And that goes to the M16, AR-15, same thing when they came together. So when, you, when I talk to military people who are, right. who are out there, and they tell me, well, the, my guys uh, who grew up as guns, gun owners and knew how to shoot an AR-15 already were so much easier to train. They were so proficient already. That's, that's a part of the American spirit. It's part of our freedom. It's being used. It's benefiting our military and our police forces. And they tell me that actually, one, one Green Bray told me that he has to spend more time 
training someone who comes from a non-gun environment, a non-gun household, uh, than he does anyone else. That wastes his time, slows him down. It's a problem. And that's, so our future, our freedom is so, and technology, it's all so interrelated. It's very interesting. Yeah, I think we're going to see a lot of it play out and continue to change over the years here at SHOT Show even. Absolutely. All right, if people want to check you out and check out some of your writings for all the different uh, magazines, yeah. where, where can they go? If you go to Forbes.com, I have a column there if I do five columns a, a month for them, so it's quite a bit there. Uh, Frankminiature.com uh, or Amazon.com for any of my books. All right, thank you so much, Frank. We appreciate you. Oh, anytime. I'm Rachel Kopchak, and this is SHOT Show TV. Mm -hmm.